Okay. Um, well, it's a great thrill to be here. Um, this is the first time anyone is going to have heard this talk. Okay, so you're the first audience going to hear it. It's about controlled trials. Now, quite a few of you here work in the basic sciences, and controlled trials aren't part of your world. But the things you see in the laboratory, if they're going to end up in the real world, have to go through controlled trials to become real out there. And controlled trials do strange things to what happens in the lab. So even if you work in the lab, you need to know a little bit about controlled trials. These days there are great concerns about the conflicts of interest that people have who run controlled trials. There's concerns about access to the data from controlled trials that pharmaceutical companies keep concealed from everyone. There's concerns about the fact that most controlled trials are ghost written. They're not written by the authors they appear to be written by. But what I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, today is the fact that even if the controlled trials were run by angels, that they've still got problems to them, problems that aren't usually recognized. I'm going to give you a talk about the origins of controlled trials first. And what you're going to hear is almost a Greek myth. And then I'm going to take you into the detail of where control trials can go wrong. Now, at the end, I'm hoping you're going to give me views and ask questions. If you don't, don't feel that you may have not heard what I've said, I mean, don't be inhibited about asking things because you think I may have cover the point. In fact, what I'm doing in this talk is to create a problem that no one has the answer for. I've asked the experts, and they don't have answers. I am not the expert giving you answers here in this talk. I'm going to outline a problem we all have, and it may be people like you here in the audience who think that, you know, I'm asking a stupid question, who really have the key to trying to solve this particular problem. Okay. Um, a good deal of the material that you're going to hear in the talk is in this handout that you all have now, hopefully. And it's also, I've got a blog on davidhealy.org, and the entries on uh, the blog these ones here are the ones that cover the material that you're going to hear now. Let me take you here to somewhere around, I guess, 19, 1950 or 55. And the man over there on the left is Joseph Lasagna, who has probably come from Piedmont somewhere. He's moved to the United States. And he's got two visitors. He's got Vincenzo Patasso and Giuseppe Bruno, who've visited him from Turin. And he's showing them minestrone. He's in the food business. He's in the restaurant business. He also has a large family. And his son, Louis Lasagna, is soon going to become the most famous doctor in the world. And he's the person who's responsible for controlled trials. And there's Louis Lasagna over on the far right. Doesn't look at all like his father there, but later in life when he became an older man, he did look very like his father. Louis Lasagne was the first professor of clinical pharmacology in the world. 
He was the person who put the placebo on the map. He's the person responsible for informed consent. And he's the person who, more than anyone else, put controlled trials on the map. This is a key article. This is from 1954. And this is the one article on the placebo that enters Medicine's Hall of Fame. And you can see that Louis Lasagne, who was then in Harvard and has just moved to Johns Hopkins University, is the first author on this article. What they're looking at is things like how you can give an opiate to, to people, and this kills pain, but you can give a placebo to some people also, and it will reduce pain just as much as the opiate does. This is a new discovery. This is Lou here as well. He's appearing on TV during the 1950s. This is black and white TV, as you see. He's a bit like people these days, doctors, the few doctors who use Facebook and Twitter. He's among the first people back then to use radio and TV and a range of other things. He's not a stuffy doctor just stuck in academia. He's trying to communicate to the wider world. The late 1950s and the early 1960s were a critical time in human history. This is a period of time when we had the Cold War, we had the nuclear bomb, we had John F. Kennedy being the president of the United States, and they, people referred to the Kennedy White House as Camelot because there was so much hope linked to it. Kennedy also had a girlfriend, Marilyn Monroe, as you see here. Lou was asked for his view on a range of things. First of all, one of the big US concerns was the fact that placebo responses, where people were being fooled, this seemed to link closely to a big concern in the United States, which was when their troops had been captured by the Chinese during the Korean War, lots of them appeared on TV saying things like, we hate the United States. And they were responsible for all the evil in the world, which left people in the United States confused as to what's going on here. They talked about troops being brainwashed and wondered how the Chinese did it. And this gave rise to a very famous book and movie, which has been remade since, called The Manchurian Candidate. Lou, because he was at the heart of the placebo response, which looked like brainwashing, was the person that the media approached to ask about all these things. He was also asked to, uh, to produce articles for the New Yorker, for the New York Times, for the Reader's Digest, for anything you care to think about on women's liberation, on astronauts, on nuclear war, on everything, not just medicine. But on all uh, the medical things he was asked for his views on, we can see now that he was almost always right. Here he is writing about controlled trials during the 1950s. And he's the person who, more than anyone else, writes about controlled trials during the 1950s. And here he is doing a further key thing. This is an article on over-the-counter sleeping pills. And he's saying that when a drug comes on uh, the market, this is during the 1950s, this is from 1956, this article, he's saying that FDA, that's the regulator, the Food and Drugs uh, Administration in the, the United States, who are responsible for letting drugs on uh, the market. What they do is they check and see if the drug's safe. But he's saying, would it be such a terrible thing if we didn't just, if, the, if people like the FDA didn't just force the company to prove their drug was safe, but if they, were for, if they were asked to get the companies to prove their drugs worked? Now, that's going to seem a very obvious thing to all of you. You know, if we let drugs on the market that don't work, they can't be safe. If we're concerned about drugs being safe, one of the key things we need to do is to make sure in the first place that they work. So all he's saying is, 
shouldn't we force the companies to prove their drugs work? Now, this is 1959, and the start of what were called the Kefauver Harris hearings. And this is the House of Congress in the, the United States are having the first ever hearings on the, on, uh, the pharmaceutical industry anywhere in the world. This is an industry that has begun to become extraordinarily profitable, the most profitable industry in the entire world, and it still is. People at the end of the 1950s had become concerned with the fact that industry seemed to be fixing prices, that the adverts for drugs seemed fraudulent, that the drug development process was seriously wrong. Often they gave the drugs to people first before they tested them out on animals at all, because it's cheaper to test them out on human beings. There was serious problems which led to these hearings here, and I don't have a point here, but up in the far left there, up at the top of the screen, the man with the black hair and, and, and glasses, that's Lou. The key person in the hearings is heard from the left in uh, the front row. That's Estes Kefauver. He's the person who's convened the hearings. And the hearings are all about the Democratic Party, the left-wing party, being on one side. They want to control uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And the, the Republican Party, the pro-business party, on the opposite side, trying to stop the Democrats controlling industry too much. So these hearings go on for two and a half years, and they peter out because there's no political will to change anything. Wonderful. Thanks. The key issue, or one of uh, the key issues, and this is a tricky issue. You may not feel you quite understand what's being said here, and that's because the people involved themselves didn't really understand. It's the key issue of, should we force industry to prove their drugs work? And here's Lou being asked by Estes Kefauver, you know, FDA uh, find it easy to work out if a drug works or not. If, if a drug's going to be brought on the market to lower blood sugar, uh, it's easy for FDA to see if this drug works or not, if it lowers blood sugars or not. Isn't it? And Lou says, yes. And the Republican person then says, this is the person who doesn't want any controls on industry. He says, well, if it's as easy as this for FDA to show drugs work, why do we need a law to say that companies should be forced to prove drugs work? Turn it the other way around, and here's a different person been asked by, the, by, by, um, by Kefauver about the issue. Kefauver is actually putting the point, which is we want to prove, or we want FDA to have the powers to be able to force companies to prove their pills work. And the response here from a person who isn't keen to have any new laws is, well, seems to me that FDA is able to work out if a drug works or not quite easily as it is, so why do we need a new law? And Kefauver is saying, well, if FDA is able to prove that a drug works, what will be, what will be the problem having a rule or law which says that they have to do just what they're doing anyway? Okay. You'll see soon now why this is a, a key point. But here's one more key point. This is the first informed consent form. Back during the 1950s, drug companies, when they had a new drug, came to a person like Marco or me and asked us to try this drug out on some patients we have and to let the company know if the drug worked or not. That's fine, except Lou realized that people, when they were being asked to try these new drugs, didn't know that this isn't a drug that isn't on the market, that it's an investigational drug. 
And he said, look, it's only fair if Marco and I are going to give a drug to one of you guys here, and you don't know that this is a completely new drug that isn't on the market at all, that you should be told this and sign a piece of paper to say that you've been informed that this is a new drug. Now, here's a change of tack. This gives you more of a feel for Louis, Louis Lasagna. Because he's been involved in the key Faber hearings, he knows a great deal about the insider workings of the pharmaceutical industry and medicine. And his agent has approached HarperCollins, as they are now, who a huge publishing firm, and saying, Dr. Lasagna could write a book for you on medicine from the inside. And the boss of Harper writes, well, I've seen the, the material that you've given me about this book, and I, quite, uh, uh, I can't quite see how it will work as a book. But this lasagna guy, he's a really nice guy. I really like him. So I think what we'll do is we'll go, we'll, we'll go ahead with his book. So his book appears in March 1962. The Kefauver hearings have ended. And here's the book. It just comes out with all of the razzmatazz of a big book launch. What you see here is, uh, is the book and a, a sh short note to Lou from a guy called, called, uh, a guy called Gorman. Okay? This is the person who's the biggest, hang on. this is the person who's the biggest um, insider in uh, the White House, the person who can go into uh, the White House and lobby for particular causes, okay, who has got the ear of both, uh, both, both houses of, of Congress and also the president. And he's writing here to Lou, and he said, look, I've given your book to JFK, and he's very impressed with it, and based on the things in your book, we're going, he's going to build this into the health care reforms that are underway then. This is a review of the book. Henry Beecher here is the professor of medicine in Harvard, and he's saying no one else in the United States or Europe could have written a book as good as this. It's profound. It picks up on all of the issues. This is a really wonderful book. Now, the book looks slightly different over in the United Kingdom. It has a cover that looks like this. And as you see on the front cover, it says, in one of the frankest, most honest books ever written by a physician, Dr. Lasagna examines his, 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 his profession. It's always a dangerous thing to examine your own profession. The review of this book in the United Kingdom looks very different to Beecher's review. This book has got quite a good index, but for no obvious reason. Nothing else in the book is good except the index. This is what the review is saying. You can't get a more damning review than that. So here's Lou, and it's March 1962. 1962 is the key year. Everything's going to happen during August and October. The first hints of what goes wrong come from a newspaper here in the United States in May of 62. These are the first hints that there's a drug over in Europe, a sleeping pill over in Europe that's causing problems. It isn't on the market in the, the, in the United States yet, but it's causing problems. There are concerns about it. This article appears in, uh, in uh, the Washington Post on, on July 15th. And this article by a guy called Mintz uh, is the one that really stops thalidomide being approved and marketed in the United States. On the way, it creates the myth of the woman in FDA, Frances Kelsey, that she's the one that held this drug up. 
But in actual fact, the article by Mintz is the one that means that this drug cannot ever be approved in the United States. Marilyn Monroe dies from an overdose of a sleeping pill three weeks later. A week after she dies, this article has appeared in Newsweek, and this has begun to give people in the, in, in the, the, in the, people in the, in uh, the USA much more detail about this drug and the problem that's beginning to emerge in Europe. They can see, for the first time, the pictures of the babies that are born without limbs. They can see the person in Germany who's raised the issues first. They can see the people from the FDA down here in the corner who have been asked, well, what have you done to prevent this drug coming on the market in the, in, in the, in the, hang on, in the USA? <clears throat> so this leads to a need for the key fiber hearings which have shut down to open up again. Okay, they've spent two and a half years at work. They've, uh, they've actually amassed a huge amount of material on how the industry works. They've been closed down because there's no will to change anything, but now things have to change. So the hearings are opened up again, and you can see Lou over there uh, on uh, the far left. And this leads to a change in the law, which is the change in the law that controls medicine and healthcare in the world today, here, the United States, and everywhere else. This gave rise to uh, the 1962 uh, FDA Act. Now, one of the things that this act does is to say we're going to force the pharmaceutical companies to prove that their drugs work, rather than just that the drugs appear to be safe, before the drug gets left on the market. On one half of the argument, you had the Democrats who were saying that a preponderance of the evidence should show the drug works. That's most of the evidence should show the drugs work. On the other half of the argument, you've got the Republicans saying that a substantial amount of evidence should show the drugs work. That is, there could be two or three clinical trials that show the drug works, but actually there could be far more trials which cast doubt on the fact the drug works. Okay? You had people split. They were up all night trying to argue the words, and the words are awfully important. And the person who solved uh, the problem was Louis, Louis Lasagna, who argued that we'll put into the act the fact that adequate and well-controlled trials carried out by experts are needed to show a drug works. This came to mean two placebo-controlled trials. If a drug has two placebo-controlled, well, two randomized placebo-controlled trials, then companies are able to bring their drug on the market. And there's 10-10-62, JFK signing the new FDA Act. And this is the only time in US history, except when the United States has gone to war, that a bill has passed through both houses of Congress on the same day. And there's the key bit. They put in that companies have to prove their drugs are effective and safe. And shortly afterwards, here's JFK with his new girlfriend, Frances Kelsey, who's being offered a, a uh, who's been honored for the role people say she's played in ensuring that this drug didn't get brought on the market. But in fact, one of the curious things here is this drug is removed from the market under the 1938 Act, the older Act. They didn't need the 1962 Act to ensure that the drug doesn't come on the market. And there's one further problem. What they've done is they've put 
placebo-controlled trials in place. Industry have to put their drugs through placebo-controlled trials before they can get on the market. But as of 1962, there had been only one drug that had been through a placebo-controlled trial before it had been marketed and had been shown in that trial to be effective and safe. And that drug was thalidomide. And the person who ran the trial was Louis Lasagna. So the system we put in place to stop thalidomide happening again is a system through which thalidomide sailed with no problems at all. Now, because he'd done this trial, Lou had been asked by the company that was trying to bring the drug on the market to go into FDA and argue that they should approve the drug. So during 1961, he had gone into FDA and said, look, I've done this trial, which shows this drug works quite well. Why don't you approve it? And after the crisis with the drug, the media got to hear about the fact that Lou had lobbied on behalf of the company and asked him, you know, how do you feel now about the fact that you tried to get this drug approved given that it causes so much problems? And his answer was, well, if Marilyn Monroe had been taking this sleeping pill rather than a barbiturate, she would be alive today. Now, in the wake of all that, FDA lost their boss. And there was a hunt on for who was going to be the new person who would be the head of FDA, the boss of FDA. And everybody thought it was going to be Louis Lasagna. Uh, he was the scourge of the pharmaceutical industry. He was the one person the industry were concerned about, who they didn't want. But as it's been reported here, as you'll see, industry got to hear that when Lou was asked if he wanted the job, he said no. He did not wish to become the boss of FDA. Anyone who would want that job has got something wrong with them. It's, a, it's just an impossible job. So industry were very relieved to hear that Lou was not going to be the next boss of FDA. What was he going to be? Well, he was at this stage extraordinarily famous. He was dining in at the White House regularly. He had been a close friend of JFK, an even closer friend of Lyndon Johnson, who became uh, the president after JFK, and Hubert Humphrey, who was Johnson's vice president. And the story in 1966, before the Vietnam War caused Johnson to step down, was that, of course, in 1968, Johnson, the Democrat, was going to run, was going to win the presidency again, and Hubert Humphrey would be his vice president, and Johnson couldn't stand for a third time. So in 1972, the Democratic ticket was going to be Hubert Humphrey and Louis Lasagna. Well, this is a joke from one of Lou's close friends, but it gives you a feeling that he was identified as a Democrat, as anti-business. But then something strange happened. Things all went wrong. And they all went wrong because of this drug here, Penalba. Penalba was a combination antibiotic. At that point in time, both in the United States and in Italy, there was lots of combination drugs. And FDA didn't approve of these. We're trying to get all combination drugs banned. One of the things that they noted was with this combination of pills that there were more deaths happening per year, they thought, 12 to 15 more deaths per year than if the drugs weren't combined. So FDA wrote to Upjohn and said, we want you to remove Penalba from the market. It's dangerous. Upjohn had a few choices. They could do what they were asked by FDA. They could withdraw the drug from the market and destroy all of the pills. They could withdraw the drug from the market, 
but not destroy all the pills. Just wait till people, doctors and people, used up all the pills that were out there. They could just stop making any more of the new drug, but continue to market it till it got used up. They could do something else. They could continue to make it and continue to market it. FDA had asked them to remove it from the market, but they hadn't forced them. Or they could wait till they were forced by FDA when FDA said, we legally require you to remove this drug from the market, and then they could fight them in the Supreme Court, and they could do everything they could not to comply with FDA. And the reason why they might do that is because this drug was immensely profitable for Upjohn. Now, this has become a very famous case in corporate ethics. And this man that you see here, Scott Armstrong, used to teach business ethics in the University of Pennsylvania to people who are going to become the CEOs of big businesses. And when he presented the Upjohn case to these people who are all going to run businesses and asked them, you know, did they approve of what Upjohn did, which was to fight FDA the entire way, all of these business leaders say, no, Upjohn's behavior was indefensible, totally indefensible, unethical. Upjohn had one uh, uh, defender. The defender was Louis Lasagna, the last person you would have thought was going to, de to de defend them. Lou had never used this drug because he didn't believe in combination drugs. He didn't think it was a good drug, but he thought the way that FDA were trying to get the drug removed from the market was wrong, because FDA were arguing this. In the case of a drug brought on the market, you have to have two placebo-controlled trials showing the drug beats placebo. What FDA were arguing was for a combination drug, you've got to have two trials showing that the combination beats each of the individual drugs. And Lou said, that's not in the regulations. You might want to remove this drug from the market, but you don't have a legal basis to do so. Okay? The response from FDA and a range of people, Lou's friends, was that Lou is now taking a position that's extraordinarily at odds with everything else he's ever said before. At the end of the day, Upjohn lost. The Supreme Court decided to remove the drug from the market. Uh, the FDA lost. The next boss of FDA was forced to go. The FDA lost even on the issue of combination drugs. They didn't ever try to remove any other combination drugs from the market after that again. Lou lost. He left Johns Hopkins University. He moved to a much smaller university in New York. He lost a load of his friends, and he lost his reputation. And there's one more bunch of losers in all this, and that's all of you. And I'm going to explain to you how you lost as well later on in the talk. Lou moved to create a center for the study of drug development. And for the next 20 years, he and his group produced evidence that the costs of bringing a drug to the market were increasing the whole time. They produced great evidence that it was taking longer and longer to bring a drug to the market. They produced good evidence that we were getting much fewer new drugs than we had during the 1950s. And all of these were positions that were industry friendly business friendly. So Lou developed a reputation as being in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry, just the opposite reputation that he had before. Part of the problem here was, as you see, he was deeply concerned about controlled trials and what 
they were doing, the control trials that he had written into the FDA Acts. This is what was bothering him. For a start, the consent form that you saw there, this was written into the 1962 Act. And before 62, when companies brought drugs uh, on the market, they could have come to Marco and me and maybe used a consent form and asked us to let you guys know this was a new drug. But after that, they'd do their research on uh, the drug and they'd, con they'd prepare a portfolio which then went to FDA and it took FDA less than a year to approve the drug. But now if a company's going to bring a new drug on the market, right from the very first use of the drug, FDA are involved. The bureaucrats are involved right from the very first day this drug is ever given to a human being, which means that it now takes over 10 years from the point that a drug is being developed first to the point that it ends up on the market. And in the process, informed consent forms have become a critical tool, have become a great friend of the pharmaceutical companies. This isn't what they actually say now. What informed consent forms say now is that we, Roche, or Pfizer, or Lilly, or whatever, will take great concern, or will take great trouble to make sure that your data remains confidential. We will show it to no one other than the FDA, for instance which of course means that when you sign an informed consent form these days, what you sign is your agreement to have your data hidden forever. It's not what Lou actually intended to happen. So here's a quote from Lou. <clears throat> Back in the old days, during uh, the 1950s, companies would go to a doctor like Marco or me and ask us to try out this new pill in a group of patients. They don't do this anymore. Is this a cause for celebration or depression? He also says later on uh, towards the end of his life, my role during the 1950s was to persuade people to do controlled trials. Now I spend my time going around the place trying to explain to people control trials are not the only way to the truth. These days, most of you probably think that how could we possibly prove a drug worked if we didn't have controlled trials? But in fact, these are all the, well, they aren't all of them, these are just a few of the drug groups who were brought on the market without controlled trials during the 1950s. We managed to bring drugs that worked very effectively onto the market without controlled trials. Where do controlled trials come from? Well, controlled trials come principally from this man here, Ronald Fisher, who is the person who came up with the idea of let's randomize in order, uh, in order to prove that things work. Fisher introduced the idea of randomization. He also introduced the idea of, of Statistical, um, statistical significance. Now, statistical significance for Fisher meant something quite different to what it means for most people now uh, uh, today. Fisher meant something close to what William Tell could do or Robin Hood could do. That is, oh no, hang on a second, I've got this slightly out of sequence, I'll have to go back to the previous slide. What he meant was this, that if a result, if you ran a controlled trial of a drug and the results were statistically, um, statistically significant, you would get the same result every time. It means that you know what you're doing. But in the case of the antidepressants, the results from the trials that have been done look much more like this. You know, there's no William Tell here, there's no Robin Hood here. 
And this came out very clearly six years ago when the FDA were faced with a problem on uh, the antidepressant group of drugs. They appeared to cause people to commit suicide. So FDA asked the companies for all of the clinical trials they had on antidepressants. And when you add the data from 100,000 people put through placebo-controlled trials together, what you found was that the active drug across all the trials barely beats placebo. Now, this has given rise to furious debates about do the antidepressants work or not, with lots of people saying, well, this kind of evidence doesn't show that the antidepressants work, and other experts saying, well, we can go into the data and we can show you that the antidepressants really work. What I'm going to put to you is that this data, this kind of scenario here, really shows that controlled trials don't work. I want to take you through this. Fisher in 1935 was not doing randomized trials of drugs. He was doing randomized trials of fertilizers. And the idea, this, um, what RCTs work awfully well for is they work awfully well for fertilizers, but it's not clear that just because RCTs work for one kind of chemical that they're going to work for a different kind of chemical that we call medicine. First of all, in the case of a fertilizer, there's only one key effect you want this chemical to have. In the case of a drug, while the company might just want it to have one effect, drugs typically have a hundred different effects. In the case of fertilizers, there's a hard outcome that we can count the number of ears of corn or grains of wheat at the end of the day, and if the fertilizer works, there's going to be more ears of corn and more grains of wheat. But in the case of drugs given to people in, in clinical trials, we don't usually count how many people are alive or dead at the end of the trial, or how many people are at work or not. We usually count changes on rating scales, or the blood glucose levels, or lipid levels. If you'd asked Fisher, would it be reasonable to do a controlled trial on a surrogate outcome like lipid levels, he would have thought this was crazy. Two key things, though, for us to keep in mind is that in a fertilizer trial, people like Fisher are looking at a population effect. When you practice medicine, the key thing for a doctor is to look at the individual patient. And the other key thing, of course, is there's no such thing as a placebo fertilizer. We do not run placebos in the RCTs of fertilizers. And it isn't obvious that when you add placebo into an RCT of drugs that you still have an RCT. So this is the issue. This is the key issue for Lou Lasagna and for you and for Marco and for me. People looking at fertilizers, trying to bring a fertilizer on the market, don't care if a few ears of corn or grains of wheat die. If there's more wheat at the end of the trial, the fertilizer works. But if Marco and I kill this girl, that's a big concern. We cannot afford to lose a single person. So back when the issue came up about Prozac causing people to commit suicide, which was 1991, first of all, the response from the company making Prozac, this is an antidepressant, one of the SSRI antidepressants, the response from the chief scientific officer within the company was he's been briefed to go on TV to talk about these issues, and he's been told, look, you've got to say to people that the problem's in the illness, not the drug, that it's depression that causes people to commit suicide, it's not Prozac, okay? But if the drug also causes, the, if both the illness and the drug can cause the problem, what I'm going to put to you is that randomization won't work. The other thing that uh, the companies do, of course, is to say that the benefits are all in the drug and none of the benefits are in the illness, the idea that the illness might clear up of its own accord. 
And the problem that this introduces is rather like the problem that you see here. Randomized control trials, randomization is all about controlling for confounders. Fisher, when he used fertilizers, was sprinkling uh, the fertilizer randomly on particular patches of ground. He was controlling at the same time for the, uh, um, uh, the amount of sun, the amount of water and things like that that fell uh, on the soil that the seeds were in. But he was pretty sure there were unknown things in there that he couldn't control for. And what randomization does is to control for these unknown things. But if the drug and the illness cause the same problem, randomization cannot control for it. You get a problem that looks like this. These two tables are exactly the same size and shape. They don't look like the same size and shape to you, but if you take, uh, um, uh, if you take uh, the slides off here, and they'll be here afterwards, so if you want to get the slides, you can. And if you draw out this slide and superimpose the table on the left on the one on the right, you'll find they're exactly the same size. Even after you do that, if you look at the image, they won't look like the same size. Let me show you how this works. We now have black box warnings on Prozac and other antidepressants that they can make people suicidal. And that's based on randomized control trial data that looks like this. There's an excess of suicidal acts on the antidepressant compared to the placebo. Based on this, FDA said SSRIs, antidepressants, can cause people to commit suicide. FDA are wrong. And any of the experts on RCTs who say that this is what RCTs show, that they show cause and effect, are also wrong. Let me explain why. The first of the antidepressants was a drug called imipramine. And it was launched in 1958. And by 1959, a meeting is convened in Cambridge, UK, because there's great jubilation about this new pill. It works extraordinarily well, and it is much more potent than Prozac and Zoloft and any of the antidepressants that we have now. The older generation of antidepressants were more um, uh, effective than the drugs we have now. Okay? This is a drug that could treat melancholia. Melancholia is a severe mood disorder that has 80 times the risk of causing people to commit suicide compared with the rest of the population. Okay, but one of the things that the people at this meeting note, okay, is that some people who go on this drug in the early days of treatment become more anxious. Lots of people have, I mean, they're all there saying this is a great drug, we're going to use it to treat people who are depressed. It's better than giving a, it's better than giving, uh, than giving electroconvulsive therapy, which was the only other option they had. But here you see the Christmas tree light bulb effect. That you've got this doctor here saying that when I put, there's a small group of people, when I put them on the drug, they become more aggressive and agitated. They may have strange thoughts. They may think about harming themselves. If we stop the drug, the problem clears up. Back until recently, uh, at least in the UK, I don't know about here, we used to have Christmas trees with Christmas tree lights. And every year after the Christmas tree and the Christmas tree lights had been up in the attic for a whole year, when you took the tree down and put the lights on it and plugged them in, they didn't work. And the trick was to go around and unscrew each of the bulbs in turn, and you'd find when you unscrewed one bulb that the lights came on. This was the broken bulb. When you screwed it in again, the lights went off. So you screwed it out again, and the, and, uh, and, uh, the lights came on, and you threw that bulb away. This is cause and effect. In the same kind of way, 
If you give a drug to people and they improve or get worse, stop the drug and they disimprove or improve again, and reintroduce the drug and you get the effect again. That's the same thing. This is cause and effect. So imipramine causes people to become suicidal. It doesn't cause them all to become suicidal. It's on the whole, it's a good thing. Okay? So if we run a placebo-controlled trial of this drug in people who are severely depressed, the results will look like this, that there'll be a reduced rate of suicidal acts in the active treatment arm and a high rate of suicidal acts in the, 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 the placebo arm. Imipramine is saving lives. This drug that causes people to commit suicide is saving lives. If you put the same drug into a trial of people who are less severely depressed, mildly depressed, the result you'll get will be one that looks like this, which is just the same as the SSRI result, that this drug causes people to commit suicide. So on the basis of this, we have this kind of scenario here, which is every time a drug, and it's not just the antidepressants, every time a drug and the illness can both cause the same thing, like being depressed can cause low libido. Antidepressants can cause low libido. Every time both the illness and the drug can cause the same problem, you don't know what's going on. Controlled trials don't work. This shows you that controlled trials don't prove cause and effect, and no controlled trial even can give you an estimate, a true estimate of the frequency with which a problem is happening. Controlled trials are useful, but they're not as useful as people have made out. If you do a controlled trial in healthy volunteers, if you take the illness out of the picture as Pfizer and all of the companies have done. They gave their SSRI antidepressants to healthy volunteers before they gave them to patients. And this was a control trial that was done in Leeds in 1982, where Zoloft was given to six women who were healthy volunteers, absolutely normal women, and the other six were given, given placebo. And the trial was ended after a week because every woman given Zoloft became agitated and anxious and aggressive in one or two cases, and probably also suicidal. Pfizer concluded at the end of this that their drug had caused this, that SSR, it's well known that SSRIs can cause these uh, effects. Ten years later, when the drug comes on the market to treat people who are depressed and people who are clinically depressed had become suicidal on the pill, Pfizer completely denied that their drug could be causing the problem. Let me show you one more trick about control trials that will interest you. In 2006, GlaxoSmithKline are facing a big problem. Their antidepressant, their SSRI, paroxetine, has data that looks like this. In the trials done in major depressive disorder, there's 11 suicidal acts in close to 3,000 patients put on the active drug. And in the same trials, there's no suicidal acts in nearly 2,000 patients put on placebo. This is a statistically significant result. The company are about to have to say their drug causes people to commit suicide. Except the company have a trick up their sleeve. They've also done trials in a group of patients who've got what they call intermittent brief depressive disorders. And in these trials, you see there's slightly more patients going on uh, to a suicidal act on the active drug, on the company drug, than have gone on to a suicidal act on placebo in the same trial. So in the major depressive disorder trials, results are 
bad for the company. In the intermittent brief depressive disorder trials, it was also bad for the company also. But this is a group of patients who, go, who are very likely to go on uh, uh, to a suicidal act. And something extraordinary happens when you add the two data sets together. All of a sudden, paroxetine becomes protective against suicidal acts. Now, this was probably done on purpose by the company. They knew probably exactly what they were doing. And they did these trials in intermittent, brief, depressive disorders to get just this result. But this result can happen by accident in every clinical condition where we don't know exactly what's going wrong in the condition, in back aches, in type 2 diabetes, in asthma, in any vague clinical condition where we've reason to suspect that the patient group is heterogeneous, that there's more than one clinical condition in there. What will happen then is just, just like adding the intermittent brief depressive disorder patients into the major depressive disorder patients, randomization will ensure the problem is hidden. Rather than revealing the truth, randomization will hide the truth. So in Italian, evidence, as I understand it, means something that's evident. What you've got here is a plot from the Anglo-Saxon world, because in English, evidence does not mean things that are evident. In evident-based medicine, I should have left this here for a bit longer, it's obvious you don't jump out of a plane without a parachute you will never see a placebo control trial for parachutes. But in evidence-based medicine, you can prove to people things work against the evidence of their own eyes. We're going to prove, well, we're going to bring one of these drugs uh, on the market as an antidepressant, okay, to just prove the point to you. Over on the far right, you've got a stimulant. You've got a FEDRA, and lots of stimulants have been shown to be antidepressants in placebo control trials. Down on the far right here, down in, at the lower right, you've got nicotine, and lots of drugs working on the cholinergic system have been shown to be antidepressants as well. Over here on the far left, you've got poppies, you've got opiates, and these are well known to be quite good antidepressants for people who've got severe mood disorders. In the middle, you've got broccoli, and most of you probably won't know what broccoli contains. It's the only plant that contains benzodiazepines, and benzodiazepines have been shown in controlled trials to be antidepressant. But what we're going to do is we're going to bring our favorite antidepressant on the market. We're going to bring alcohol on the market as an antidepressant. You think it can't be done? Well, the only reason that it can or hasn't been done at the moment is because no company can take a patent out on alcohol. That's the reason that it hasn't been done. Let's say this plant had just been found and we had worked out how to make wine from the vine, okay? And we could take a, a patent out on it. Well, to bring it on the market as an antidepressant, you only have to go through six-week trials. What, we have, what we'd have is a glass of red wine and a glass of red liquid that looks like wine as the placebo control. And all we would have to do is, in six-week trials, show that people who are depressed on a rating scale showed some benefit from the one or two, one or two glass is a really good wine we ask people to take for a six-week period. Now, wine would make you a little less anxious. It would help you uh, actually uh, to fall asleep. So on the rating scales we use in antidepressant trials, it's absolutely sh for sure that we would be able to show that alcohol was superior to 
placebo. We only have to show it in one out of five trials we do. We only have to have two trials where the real high quality red wine beats the red liquid, okay? In eight trials out of 10, it may not beat it, but we don't have to show it beats it in all of the trials. We know, I mean, as the company that brings alcohol on uh, the market as an antidepressant, even though we've only got two positive trials, on average, companies write 50 publications based on each trial they do. So there'll be 100 publications out there saying that alcohol, red wine, is a wonderful antidepressant. We've only done two trials that have worked. We've hidden the results of all of the rest. The world doesn't know there are eight more trials where red wine didn't work. We can put all of the effects. The results for alcohol may be a bit like the results you've seen for the antidepressants, that the placebo is nearly as good as alcohol, but still in the articles that we write, we can put all of the benefit of alcohol down to alcohol and none of it to placebo. We can do a Mexican trick. In the case of one of the drugs used to, uh, as a mood stabilizer, what the company did was to run a, a trial in 32 hospitals, 30 in the United States and two in Mexico. And if you take the results from the 30 US hospitals, aripiprazol did not beat placebo. The Mexican hospitals, however, in their bit of the trials, aripiprazol was wonderful. Every person that got this drug did extraordinarily well, and anyone who got placebo did horribly poorly. So when you add the Mexican results into the US results, all of a sudden, aripiprazole marginally beats placebo. FDA look at this and say, very odd results that came up from Mexico, but they still approved aripiprazole as a mood stabilizer. Now, we can do the same thing for alcohol. We could have the trials in Italy might, you know, not be all that good, but over in Ireland, I can assure you we can get two hospitals which will produce wonderful results for alcohol. And if we mix them into the results from here, you have a wonderful antidepressant. We can bring gin and whiskey and beer and wine and rum all on the market as antidepressants, even though they're essentially all the same thing. We can even have patients being treated with gin and whiskey and rum and beer. I mean, if each of them have been proven to work and the, per and the patient isn't getting well, it makes sense to have the patient on more than one drug that's been proven to work. Why not have them on gin and whiskey and beer and wine and rum? Whiskey, for the, I mean, I know you guys don't speak English. It's not your first language. Some of you may think whiskey is spelled W-H-I-S-K-Y. Well, Irish whiskey is spelled W-H-I-S-K. EY, and I'm Irish. Japanese whiskey. When it comes to um, uh, the side effects, well, alcohol in a six week trial is not going to have serious problems linked to it. It's not going to double the rate of people going on to a suicidal act the way the SSRIs do in six-week trials. It's not going to increase the rate of people going on to a aggressive and homicidal acts the way SSRIs do in six-week trials. In the case of pregnancy, um, because what we'll be able to argue is leaving a nervous disorder untreated is bad for you, so we will be encouraging you to take alcohol through pregnancy. If you don't, it's bad for your unborn baby. In the case of the SSRIs, the evidence is that they double the rate of birth defects, double the rate of miscarriages, and double the rate of developmental delay in children born to mothers who've been on them through pregnancy, but yet we encourage women to take them through pregnancy. In the case of alcohol, when patients have been on for three to six months and are feeling quite well and try to stop it, 
and feel nervous and anxious again, doctors will know that the thing to say to patients is, well, this is your illness coming back, and you need to remain on alcohol for the rest of your life. It couldn't be dependence on and withdrawal from our drug, which is exactly what we say in the case of the SSRIs. Right. We say to them, this is your illness coming back. You have a disorder that's like insulin dependence, diabetes, and you need to remain on this drug for the rest of your life. Let me move on. So one of the issues here is we've ended up in a world as well, which is a world full of clinical guidelines which increasingly dictate to doctors what they should do. We're ending up in a, in a world that's like an agricultural world as opposed to what medicine used to be. We used to put a lot of faith on doctors' judgments. We don't put any faith on professionals' judgment anymore. Doctors increasingly are told what it is that they have to prescribe. And it's usually the latest drug is the one they have to prescribe, even when all the evidence is that this is weaker and more costly than older drugs. These are some cartoons that bring the point home. The pain um, um, began on the day my daughter left home, is what he's saying. And what she's doing is she's filling up a rating scale. Doctors cannot see their patients anymore. They cannot see or hear their patients anymore. Doctor uses clinical judgment, atrocity. It's an atrocity that a doctor would use their own clinical judgment. On a scale of 1 to 10, how happy was your husband with his medical treatment? And of course, what's happening here is a little bit like because RCTs are called the gold standard these days. Everything linked to an RCT has become a gold standard also. And rating scales like this are linked to RCTs. This is what we use to show that antidepressants work. There are more lives lost on the antidepressant than on the placebo in antidepressant trials. But still, we can show the antidepressants work by using rating scales. But just like like, uh, just like King Midas found, the gold standard means that everything you touch, you kill. And this is what our cities are doing to medicine. Randomization controls for confounders that are linked to a primary effect of the drug. But as I've said to you, the drug is doing 99 other things. And what we do in control trials is to hypnotize people to just look at one thing and to miss the other things that are happening. So it generates ignorance. It may be that in the control trial, what we want is the drug to turn people blue. And doctors in control trials are trained and focused in on looking at has the person turned blue, and they miss the fact that the, person, that, you know, the patient in front of them has also grown feathers. RCTs give us weaker drugs, as I'm going to show you. Two more quick things. Drugs, we used to regard that in medicine, drugs used to be regarded as poisons. And the art of medicine was to use poisons with care, to get the right dose to make sure that the risks from the poison were outweighed by the risks of the illness that you could hopefully treat with the poison. But now drugs are regarded as fertilizers to be sprinkled as widely as we can, to put people on as many drugs as we can, to put people on drugs as early in their life as we can, to put children on as many drugs as we can. Because what's wrong with using a fertilizer? It can only cause things to grow. So here's uh, the message. All RCTs do harm. Some also do good. And the question is, when do the risks outweigh? When does the benefit justify the risks? Well, there's one clear point where the benefit does justify the risks, and this was something discovered by women, mainly. Now, this is, this is uh, the best example. This is the Women's Health Initiative 
randomized controlled trials of hormone replacement treatment, a drug that clearly works in the short term. But if you run a trial which lasts years and look at what actually happens when you have people having HRT and people not having HRT, the outcome was that more women taking the HRT died from different kinds of cancers than the women not taking the HRT. This is an effectiveness trial. It takes years to run a trial like this. But remember, the FDA Act said we want it's legally required of companies to prove their drugs are effective, not just that they have a benefit in the short term, but that they're actually effective. In fact, you could argue that legally, none of the antidepressants have been brought on the market legally because six-week trials cannot show that these drugs are effective. If we ran a trial like this of the antidepressants and looked at the rate at which people went on to commit suicide, at the rate of birth defects and other things that happen on the antidepressant compared to placebo, it's not clear what we would think of the antidepressants, how effective we really thought they were. There's, you've seen this list before. These are the drug groups we had during the 1950s. These are the examples from those groups that we had during uh, the 1950s. We've got newer drugs now than these ones here. These are the ones that came on the market during uh, the 1950s. We've got newer drugs now. In the case of the antidepressants you see here, we've got drugs like Prozac. In the case of the antihistamines you see here, we've got new ones. In the case of the antipsychotics, we've got new ones. In the case of the drugs used to lower blood sugar, we've got new ones. In all cases, the newer drugs are weaker than the older drugs. There is no good example of a newer drug from any of these groups that's more effective than the older drug we had in the 1950s before RCTs. And this is no surprise because RCTs are placebo-controlled trials where a drug just has to barely be placebo to get on the market. During the 1950s without placebo-controlled trials, it had to be obvious to Marco and me that this drug worked. I mean, it had to obviously work rather than be placebo in a controlled trial. So, <clears throat> you remember I said this was the one drug that had been through placebo-controlled trials before it came on the market. There's one more big mystery in all this, and we're just about to end, okay? I've gone on a little bit longer than I thought. We're just about to end. Thalidomide, which, of course, did not come on the U.S. market in 1962. It is on the U.S. market now. It's on the market in many countries around the world. This is not a baby from the 1950s, 1960s, early 1960s in Germany whose mother had a sleeping pill. This is a baby in Brazil where there are over a thousand babies that look like this whose mothers have been on thalidomide for leprosy or multiple myeloma or a range of other conditions in none of which is there placebo-controlled trial evidence that the drug works. The company didn't want, like Upjohn, didn't want to give up on their drug. The company behind thalidomide, pharmaceutical companies never want to give up on a drug. Now, does this mean that they're evil or what's going on? Well, no, it doesn't. I've shown you this before, and I've told you this was the case that was used where business people all say Upjohn were unethical to do what they did, to fight this case the whole way to the Supreme Court. They should have just withdrawn their dangerous drug from the market. But in actual fact, when Scott Armstrong went on to do a different experiment, which was he took all of you guys and he got you to act as the Upjohn board. And he told you what the drug was worth to the company, and he showed you what the, what the 
duties of people who are on the board of the company were, in every case, you did exactly the same thing that Upjohn did. We all, I mean, it's not that there's a strange group of people who work in the pharmaceutical industry and we're good people. They and we are exactly the same people. Here's Louis Lasagne at the end of his life. And he's picked out a quote here from a person called Bradford Hill, who is the person who did the first randomized control trial of a drug in humans. And Bradford Hill, 20 years later, you would have thought he would be the enthusiast for randomized control trials. 20 years later, like Louis Lasagne, he too is saying, Randomized control trials have their problems. It's good that we don't just rely on experts like Marco here. And I mean, it, it was good. I mean, he's got great clinical judgment, but it's good that we don't just rely on his judgment only. It's good that we also have control trials. But if we, if we ever get to a world where we only have control trials and pay no heed to the judgments of senior doctors like Marco, the pendulum hasn't just swung too far, it has come off its hook completely. And as Lou says, evidence-based medicine has become synonymous with controlled trials, even though such trials fail to tell a doctor what he really wants to know, which is, which drug is the best for the patient in front of me? A doctor really needs to make sure he doesn't kill the girl here. Can we dim the light slightly? OK. Right. Just one quick. We'll take this back, hopefully. Oh. 